This is the third PowerPoint in Unit 4, and it's a continuation of equilibrium with a focus on buffers. I'm sure you've heard of buffers before. Um, they are a certain type of solution that resists changes in pH, so they maintain the pH um, at whatever level is desirable for that solution. And I just have this image on the cover slide because our body has the most amazing buffer system in it um, based on carbon dioxide. So if you're, I'm not gonna go through details, but if your breathing um, goes down too low, you're going to accumulate too much carbon, carbon dioxide and your, your body has a really cool way to eliminate the excess carbon dioxide. So again, a buffer is simply a solution that resists changes in pH, and how it does that is it simply has a, a weak acid and weak base system, which we'll go into more later, um, that neutralizes um, any added acid or added base. So if, let's say swimming pool, we like to maintain that at a certain pH, right? But if, if an acid or a base gets accidentally dumped in, somebody pees in the pool or whatever, um, there's a buffer system present to consume or react with that contaminant. And that maintains the pH uh, where you want it to. A buffer is made up of a mixture of a weak acid and its conjugate base. So we have always represented those like this, right? weak acid and conjugate base, or a weak base and its conjugate acid. So we'll just call B base and call BH conjugate acid, okay? So it has to have both. It's gotta have a base and an acid, an acid or ba and a base, so that it can consume, chew up any contaminant that's either acidic or basic. So if you imagine the buffer <clears throat> consists of a weak acid and its conjugate base, let's look at both scenarios. Let's look at adding a basic contaminant, some type of hydroxide. So the part of the buffer that is going to spring into action if we add a basic contaminant is the weak acid. And what's really cool is look what happens when the weak acid in a buffer re reacts with a contaminant base. What do you get? You make the conjugate base of the weak acid and water. So you've completely elim eliminated the contaminant and you've just made a little bit more of one of the components of the buffer. And because you've essentially converted a strong base into a weak base, weak bases have less effect on pH. So let's go through the same type of argument if we add a acid contaminant, a strong acid contaminant to a buffer system. In this case, since the contaminant's an acid, the weak base component of the buffer, or conjugate base, weak base, whatever you wanna call it, is going to be what scavenges up the acidic contaminant. And again, look what is made when the, when the weak base reacts with the acid contaminant. It simply makes more of the original weak acid. And so what you have here is, um, let's see if I can get rid of all this. What you have is a weak acid and weak base that simply fluctuate in how much of each of them is present, depending on how much contaminant was added. So they just go back and forth, making a little bit more of the other one as they chew up contaminant. <clears throat> so let's look at a specific one. Let's look at acetic acid and its conjugate base, acetate, a very common buffer system, weak acid and its conjugate base. So let's say that we added a hydroxide contaminant, sodium hydroxide or something like that. Um, the first thing you need to do is decide is what component of the buffer system is going to react with the contaminant. 
Obviously, bases react with acids and vice versa. So if we're adding a base contaminant, you need to look for the acid component of the buffer and write out a reaction between those two. So here we go. The base contaminant is going to react with the acid component of the buffer and is going to make water and then the conjugate base. So um, in essence, the strong base has been converted to a weak base, which again has a lesser effect on pH. We can go through the same type of argument again for an acidic contaminant. So if we add some type of strong acid, again, the first thing you need to be able to do is decide which of the two components of the buffer is going to react with a contaminant. In this case, um, acids react with bases, right? So an acid contaminant is going to react with the weak base or the conjugate base. So you need to be able to write out a balanced reaction for those two. And again, the um, component of the buffer system that reacts with the contaminant is just going to be converted to the um, its conjugate pair. So again, we've eliminated the strong acid contaminant and simply replaced it with a weak acid, which will have less effect on the pH. So the bottom line is you start out with a buffer system, and we'll go over this later, but typically there are roughly equal amounts of the weak acid and its conjugate base or weak base and its conjugate acid. And every time you add a contaminant, um, depending on which component it reacts with, so an acid's going to react with the base component and make more of the acid component. So if you have an acid, con and if you add an acid contaminant, you're going to end up with just a little bit less of the base component and just a little bit more of the acid component, right? You're adding acid, so you expect to end up with more acid. On the other hand, if you add a base contaminant, you're going to end up with a little bit more of your conjugate base and a little bit less of the weak acid. And so the ratio of the base to acid, the weak base, right, to the weak acid in the buffer is going to change just a little bit. And you'll see later on when we do our calculations that we'll be looking at the ratio of these two components of the buffer. <clears throat> this is just a simple definition that um, you should be very familiar with. It's called buffer capacity, and that's basically how much contaminant can a buffer handle. And that's very simple, okay? The more, the more buffer, the, the higher the concentration of weak acid in its conjugate base, the more capacity it has, okay? The less of the conjugate pair that you have in solution, the less it can handle, okay? So buffer capacity is just how much contaminant can it handle. And um, so very simply said, the higher the buffer concentration, higher the conjugate pair concentration, the better the buffer capacity. And just kind of as a, a side thing, you should be aware that um, close to a one-to-one -one ratio of the weak acid and its conjugate base works best in a buffer. It doesn't have to be exactly one-to-one, -one, so you might have um, anywhere from 10 to 1 base to acid um, all the way to 1 to 10 base to acid okay, are completely acceptable good buffers. But if it gets outside of a 10 to 1 ratio, that doesn't make a very good buffer. So let's talk about the calculations. How do you calculate the pH of a buffer system. Well, there's this magic equation. This is the derivation, which you do not need to be able to do, but I always like to have it there. Helps you understand where these magical equations come from. This is called the Henderson-Hasselbalch equation. And I'm gonna tell you right now, the world in general is gets very confused with buffer systems and buffer calculations, and there's really absolutely no need for that. When you recognize a buffer problem, and it won't always tell you, I'll help you know how to recognize it.
all you do is pull out your your handy dandy Henderson Hasselbach equation and you're just gonna plug and chug okay so there are some textbooks that that go through this derivation and present the calculations very complex and confusing there is just no need okay just use the Henderson Hasselbach alrighty so um, looking a little bit more closely at the Henderson Hasselbach um, you need to have the Ka of the weak acid that makes up the buffer system. You're going to convert that to pKa. Remember that pKa is minus log of Ka. So the Ka will have to be given to you. And then you have the ratio of another way to put this that makes more sense to most students instead of A minus. Just put whatever the base is in the buffer system over whatever the acid is. Now, the, the, this is the weak base and weak acid. These are not contaminants. These are the actual buffer conjugates. Um, but, it, but remember now that the concentration of the base goes in the numerator. Students forget that. It's probably the most common mistake in these calculations is inverting this ratio. So the base goes on top. The acid goes on bottom. Now, this is a nice little shortcut. Because it's a simple ratio and units cancel out, even though the, the formula says concentration, molarity, if the problem just gives you moles of each, you don't have to bother to convert it to molarity because the units are going to cancel. So whether you have moles over moles, you're going to get the same ratio as you would if you had molarity over molarity. Okay, So that just makes it kind of nice. Oh, another really kind of cool thing is that if the ratio of the conjugate base to the weak acid, if this ratio is exactly 1, guess what happens? What is log of 1? Log of 1 is 0, and so if you have exactly a 1 to 1 ratio of those two, simply pH equals pKa. Now, I think most of you have either worked on or are shortly going to be working on the um, KA lab, and you make a graph, I think, of the titration where um, you calculate pH, and the halfway point is where concentration of conjugate base equals concentration of the original weak acid, and that is how you find pKa in your lab. So what they're capitalizing on is this simplification of the Henderson Hasselbach. Oh, this little tidbit at the bottom is uh, really nice. There's often a um, multiple choice question that will ask you to select um, a weak acid conjugate base system to match the pH that you want. So let's just say I want a buffer system that will maintain a pH of 5. And then the question would say, which of the following conjugate pairs should I pick for a buffer system? And what you want to do is you want to look for a weak acid, okay, or that has a pKa that's very close to five. All right, so the, the weak acid that has um, a pKa closest as possible to the pH you want to maintain the buffer system at is the one you want to pick. So let's go ahead and do a practice calculation. Calculate the pH of a solution that is 0.5 molar in HCN, hydrocyanic acid, and 0.2 molar in sodium cyanide. All right, so the first thing to realize here, so listen real carefully to this, because this messes students up. A lot of times, most of the time, you're gonna have to recognize when you're dealing with a buffer problem, because it won't usually say buffer in the question. And so how do you recognize? Well, you're looking for a weak acid and its conjugate base. So again, reminder again, you need to have your list of strong acids and bases out if you haven't memorized them. 
Um, so you may say, okay, yeah, HCN is a weak acid. Okay, so um, what is its conjugate base? The conjugate base of that is cyanide. Lovely, huh? Deathly. Um, and so you might like, wait a minute, that's not really the same thing as cyanide. Well, is this a buffer or not? Yes. Okay, so this is what I want you to listen carefully to. This is an ionic compound, right? And it's a soluble one. I don't know if you remember this, but all ionic compounds that have a group one metal as the cation are, are completely soluble. So what happens, and I've said this probably 2,000 times this semester, what happens when you put an ionic compound in water? It immediately dissociates. And so guess what? Why, does, why is sodium cyanide there? It is a source of the conjugate base. So I'm going to put this really simple for you in case you want to jot it down as a note. Ionic compounds are added to solutions to provide a conjugate base. Okay, Ionic compounds are added to buffer solutions to provide a conjugate base. So it's the anion of the ionic compound that serves as a conjugate base and a buffer. So anyway, going back to working out this problem, calculate the pH. So now the, the biggest tackle of this one, the biggest challenge of this one, is to be able to identify it as a buffer problem. So we just did, and so now immediately the next thing you should do is write down the Henderson-Hasselbalch equation. And remember that the base goes on top and the acid goes on bottom. And make sure that you take this ratio, you calculate it first before you take the log of it, okay? So now we have pH equals, formula for pKa is minus log of whatever the Ka is. plus log, and again, remember, you can either have concentrations of the base in acid or moles. In this case, they gave us concentration, so be careful. The base is the ionic compound, right? So 0 0.20 molar base over concentration of the acid is 0 0.50 molar. And you're all set. Now you just do your calculation. I had forgotten. I'd written it all out for you already. So I already said this on the last slide, but it doesn't hurt to have it written down again for you. So let's go ahead and um, go through the calculation. Uh, the Ka value right here. So the pKa equals 9.31 and let's see point, point 0.2 divided by point 0.5 so that is equal to point 0.4 and the log of point 0.4 is point 0.398 and so the overall pH is 8.91 and that is the buffer solution on its own. It hasn't been disturbed by anything. So somebody obviously wanted to maintain a solution with a pH of close to 9. I want to just take a quick minute to remind you about sig figs of log numbers that are a result of taking a logarithm. My reminder here is that only the digits to the right of the decimal are significant. So this has two sig figs. So in any type of number that's derived from a log, any digits to the left, simply rep left of the decimal, simply represent the exponent, and they don't say anything about precision. And precision is what sig figs are all about. So this has two sig figs. So if you wrote pH of three, Guess what? No sig figs, okay? So if you wrote 3.1, that has one sig fig because it has one digit to the right of the decimal. So be aware of that, okay?
Now the problems get a bit more complicated, but these are an important type of calculation to be able to do. And that is, what is the pH of a buffer system after it has been disturbed, after it's been contaminated with either a strong acid or a strong base? All of these calculations, you may want to take notes of this because it's, and you're going to have to practice several of them, please, to really get it square in your head. Um, if you have, if you have disturbed a buffer or contaminated a buffer, it is a two-step calculation. It's almost like two separate problems. The first step is a stoichiometry calculation. We use what we call a mole table, which I'll show you shortly. Anytime you need to do stoichiometry, anytime you have to figure out how much of something has reacted, um, you have to do stoichiometry. You have to get into moles. You have to get out of concentration and into moles. After you find out, because you're going to remember when you disturb a buffer, you're making a new amount of the, the conjugate pair. So your ratio of the conjugate pair is going to change, which is going to affect the Henderson-Hasselbalch equation and pH. So once you get the new amounts of the conjugate pair, then you can use the Henderson-Hasselbalch equation to get the new pH. So this is where you're going to have to really keep your brain cells awake and pay attention. This is a prime candidate for a free response problem. This problem is wanting you to calculate pH when 10 milliliters of one molar HCl is added to pure water. And if you would have done the KA lab in person, you would have actually done this experiment. And you should expect to see a large change in pH. So part A, there's no buffer present. So you expect a large change in pH. We're gonna just see how large it is. And then you're gonna add the same amount, 10 milliliters of one molar HCl, to a buffer system and we're gonna see how much it changes the pH of the buffer system. Now, part A, we know that pure water starts out at a pH seven, right? And so it'll be easy for us to calculate what the new pH is after the HCl is added. Part B, we don't know right off the top of our head what the pH to begin with is of the buffer. So part B is gonna have two pH calculations, one of the pure buffer and one after it's been contaminated. This is probably the most important part, well, the most brain draining part of the PowerPoint. So you really wanna try to pay attention as much as you can and see if you can understand this type of problem. It's a prime candidate for a free response problem. So in part A, there's no buffer. So this is just from several weeks ago. Um, what is the pH of an acidic solution? And so what have we got here? Let's just step back and look. We've got a solution of hydrochloric acid, 10 milliliters of it, and we are mixing that together with 100 milliliters of pure water. Now what I'm getting ready to say is critical for a lot of problems on your final throughout this semester. I would jot it down. Anytime you mix two solutions together, whether they're going to react or they're just going to blend, Anytime you mix them together, you can use the dilution formula to figure out the new concentration. Anytime you mix one thing with something else, you are diluting it, okay? It is no longer going to be one molar HCl because you're, you've added something else to it. So um, the only complication is if there's a chemical reaction involved, you have to use, uh, you have to take in a, into account the um, mole ratio of the chemical reaction. But in this case, there's no reaction, it's just a, an all out dilution. So we're gonna use M1V1 equals M2V2. In other words, um, one molar HCl, we use 10 milliliters of it. We're going to try to solve for the molarity of the new um, diluted solution of HCl times, it's always times total volume on the right-hand side, right? So the total volume is the 100 milliliters of water plus the 10 milliliters of HCl. 
When we go ahead and solve for that, we get that the concentration, new concentration, diluted concentration of HCl is 0 0.0091. And we know since HCl is a strong acid, that it's not going to exist in that form. It's going to exist in the hydronium form. And then if you remember the formula for pH, it equals minus log of the concentration of hydronium ion. So don't forget knowledge that you knew several weeks ago. Now is the time to start thinking about the final and actually methodically studying. So when you get to a problem like this, if you're shaky on or not quite sure, instead of just rushing through to finish the problem, go back and review. Make sure that you know, you've got the dilution formula and you know how to calculate pH, etc. So the bottom line is though, when we add 10 milliliters of one molar HCl to pure water, what happens to the pH? It goes from neutral seven all the way down to a pH of one, okay? That's six orders of magnitude um, just from 10 milliliters of one molar HCl. That's a huge change. So now let's look at adding the same amount of HCl to a buffer solution and see how much change we get there. <clears throat> Before we start calculating with the buffer though, I want a couple of conceptual, this would be a multiple choice type conceptual questions that some of you have kind of not spent enough time on. So um, I would recommend turn the video off for a second, see if you can answer this, and then I'll walk you through it. Which part of the buffer, now what was our buffer? It was acetic acid in the problem, and its conjugate base, which is the acetate. Which part of the buffer will HCl react with? Remember I said that's the first question you're going to have to address. It's going to react with, since it's an acid, it's going to react with the base portion. And you need to be able to draw a balanced reaction between the two of them because you're going to have to set up stoichiometry in a mole table. Remember now that an acid-base reaction is very simple. Don't complicate it. All you do in an acid-base reaction is move the acidic hydrogen from where it's starting from to from the original acid to the base. So what do you end up with? Okay, and then all right. So the correct answer was this. I usually leave the um, cation out just because it's a spectator ion and it's more clear to me to just look at this, but you can do it either way. It's perfectly fine. One more quick question. Again, <clears throat> I would encourage turning the video off, seeing if you can answer this. What do you expect will happen to the pH of the buffer when you add HCl? Well, this is very simple too, so don't overcomplicate it. This is an acid, right? If you add an acid to anything, even a buffer solution, the pH is going to go down. Okay, so don't overcomplicate it. It's that simple. Since it's a buffer solution, the pH is only going to go down a little bit. If it was pure water, it would go down a lot. All right, here we go. <clears throat> now, since we are dealing with a buffer, it is a two-step, and we've disturbed the buffer with HCl. It is a two-step calculation. Step one is doing some stoichiometry in moles. Again, anytime you have a chemical reaction, you need to get out of molarity and into moles. It is moles that reacts. So we already wrote the balanced reaction. When we add an acidic contaminant, it's going to react with the base component of the buffer. So here's our balanced reaction. We're going to set it up just like an ice table, but this is not an ice table. This is a mole table. So instead of dealing in concentrations, we're dealing in moles. But it's the same type of thing. The initial moles we had of each <clears throat> before the reaction occurs, the change, and then the final moles. It is the final moles that we need to get our hands on 
because that's what's going to be plugged into the henderson hasselbach equation all right so how do we get initial moles this is solution stoichiometry so remember that if you multiply volume liters or milliliters by molarity you will get moles okay so volume times molarity gives you moles. All righty, so um, acetate, the conjugate base. What was it to begin with? Uh, well, the original molarity of it was one molar, but we only used 100 milliliters of it. So I converted milliliters to liters, multiplied it by the molarity, and this is moles of acetate that we have to begin with. HCl. Lightning has been detected near your location. Thank you, Daisy. Um, got my weather alert up. So HCl, again, starts at one molar. How much of that do we use? Only 10 milliliters. Okay. So we have 0 0.01 moles of HCl. The acetic acid is going to be equal to the acetate. They added the same amount. It was one molar in acetate and one molar in acetic acid and 100 milliliters of the mixture of them. All right, so now listen really carefully here. When you disturb a buffer, however much of the contaminant, in this case HCl you have, is going to completely react. The contaminant will always be a strong acid or a strong base. So 100% of it will react. So we're going to take that total number of moles and we're going to subtract it. And there will be zero contaminant left. All of it's going to react. What is it going to react with? It's going to react with the basic component. So from this original 0.1 mole, you have to subtract however many moles of the contaminant you have. And so now you have uh, less of the base component. And what do you make when this reaction occurs? You're making more of the weak acid. So instead of 0.1 mole of acetic acid, we, we made a little bit more, 0.01, so we have a little bit more of the acid. So now go ahead and plug into the henderson hasselbach as I said before, you have to be given the Ka. Um, hopefully I did on the last page. So the Ka for acetic acid is 1.8 times 10 to the minus 5. If you take the log of that, you get 4.74. Uh, minus log of that, I mean. And then remember, again, henderson hasselbach is log the concentration, the base component of the buffer over the acid component of the buffer. So the base component is the acetate, 0.09, and the acid component is 0.11. When you plug all that in, you get a pH of 4.65. What was the original pH of acetic acid before we disturbed it? I should have put that on a separate slide, but real quickly, um, the pH of um, originally before it was disturbed, again, you still use the henderson hasselbach because it's still a buffer system. And the only thing that's going to be different is the ratio of the acid to base. So in the beginning, there were equal amounts of the base and acid. And so what does that mean? When they're exactly equal amounts, remember that that ratio becomes 1. Log of 1 is 0. And so pH simply equals pKa, which is 4.74. So the pK, or excuse me, pH changed, went from 4.74 to 4.64. It didn't even move one entire pH unit, whereas when we added HCl to pure water, it was six pH units. And that is it for buffers. So I think buffers, more than the other topics in this unit, are the calculations are pretty complex. So it, 
it's quite important that you look at the practice worksheets I posted in D2L for buffers and work several of them. That's it for now, though.